All right, welcome to day one of the Quadrant Essentials course. And in this first video, we're going to dedicate it to talk about the core data entity in Quadrant, which is the point. We've talked about it a little bit in day zero, but just to recap, a point in Quadrant is made up of three main parts. We have the ID. We also have the vector made up of a certain number of dimensions. And we also have a payload. Now, starting up by explaining a bit about the ID, which is a very important piece of your point, and every point within Quadrant also has an associated ID with it. Now, this ID uh, keeps track of the individual vectors within Quadrant, and you can use the ID to retrieve a vector by the ID. You can also use it to update your vector if you'd like, and you can also use it to delete a specific vector. There are two types of IDs that you can have. First, you can use a 64-bit positive integer, if you'd like, or also a UUID, also known as Universally Unique Identifier. Now, if you don't give your point an ID, then Quadrant will assign randomly a UUID to your point. Here are some examples of UUID string representations. And then, we have the vector. Now, this is the most interesting part of your point because it will define how your point is presented within the vector space. Now, there are different types of vectors that you can have. So let's explain step by step what each one means and how they are built and what they do. So the first type of vector that you can have is a dense vector. Those are vectors usually created by what we call embedding models, or also neural networks. Embedding models learn from large data sets to understand meaning and context within data and serve to place them uh, within a vector space in such a way that similar things are placed close together within the vector space. That way, we can use those embedding models to capture complex relationships within our own data as well. For example, if I use an embedding model for text data, then that embedding model will be able to capture semantics and context and relationships associated with my text data. Let's say I have a sentence that's basically striped blue shirt made of cotton. And I pass that sentence through an embedding model and the embedding model gives back to me the embedding of that sentence. And then I pass through that same embedding model a similar sentence, but not quite the same, cotton made maritime shirt. Now, those two sentences are not the same, but they have a similar meaning. We can understand that. So if I pass through the same embedding model, the second sentence, it will generate a similar embedding to my first one. Now, that means that those two sentences will be placed closely within the vector space, which also means that they have a similar relationship between words going on that is captured by my embedding model. Now, this will happen across all of my tax data or any type of data that I embed throughout my collection. So, for example, if I have words that have similar meanings, for example, pretty, beautiful, those will be placed uh, closely together within my vector space and far away from words that have a very opposite meaning to it, for example, ugly or grotesque. Words that are neutral or impartial can occupy a place kind of in the middle of uh, the embedding space. Obviously, we're going to be working with many dimensions, and the visualization becomes much more complex than that. But you get the idea. Those are mostly what we understand as dense vectors. And even though dense vectors are the most used when we're talking about vector search because of its incredible similarity search properties, they are not the only type of vector that we can work with. We also can work with sparse vectors, which is basically also a high dimensional vector, but most of their values is zero. These types of vectors are usually generated by statistical methods like BM25, or sparse neural encoders like splayed. And they're very useful if we want to apply keyword search within our searches. And 
use techniques like hybrid search, for example. We can also represent a sparse vector by the indices of the non-zero value and the values of each indices. And basically, all indices must be unique and both arrays must have the same length. And beside this, in sparse, we also have what we call multivectors. And multivectors is basically a property that allows you to store multiple vectors per point. And we can also call it as a matrix of dense vectors per point. Now, these types of embeddings are usually generated by models like Colbert and very useful if we're talking about using techniques like late interaction. Now, this is something we're going to see later on in the course, but it's very useful for you to know that this can also be done. And those are things that you can also work with. So those are the three main types of vectors that you can start with in quadrants. Dense vectors, sparse vectors, and also multivectors. Now, it can store multiple types of vectors per point as well. So I can have a point with both sparse and dense vectors or two dense vectors and one sparse vectors and so on. We can do this by using what we call named vectors. You also have, for example, to name a sparse vector because sparse vectors must be named and dense vectors don't have to be named necessarily. But if you're planning on working with multiple vectors per point, uh, named vectors is a very useful tool for you to have. Now let's talk about vector dimensionality and what it means, all of those dimensions. Can I have a vector of 10 dimensions or a thousand? And what's the difference? The choice of dimensionality affects both search quality and performance. The rule of thumb is that smaller dimensions, that's usually between 384 to 512 dimensions, those are faster, uh, more performant, but also they have less details about that vector or that point. For uh, mid-sized dimensions, which it's usually around 768 until like 1,536, that's basically a good balance between performance and accuracy. Now, if we're working with over 3,000 dimensions, that's a lot of precision and it can come at the cost of performance. Now, one vector that has 1,536 dimensions in flow 32 takes about 6 kilobytes of memory. Now, multiply that by 1 million, which is a very reasonable amount of points to have within our collection, and now we're staring at 6 gigabytes of memory. And if you're using 3,072 dimensional embeddings, that's the double of the storage. So you need to keep in mind those kind of things when you're thinking about scaling your system. So you don't use a type of embedding that gives you a lot of precision, but then your searches and performance um, will be affected by that. And maybe, maybe sometimes you don't need all of that precision. We're gonna go deeper into all of that, but for small scales, most likely your search and storage won't be affected. And there's a lot you can do with only the free tier at Quadrant Cloud. Now, a lot of the questions that we get are also about embedding models and how you should choose your embeddings. Now, let's talk about three of the main approaches so you can get embedding models easily. First, and what we usually recommend if you're looking for a fast way to embed and high performance is to use fast embed. FastEmbed is a optimized embedding solution designed specifically for Quadrant. It delivers low latency, CPU-friendly embedding generation, eliminating the need for heavy frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow. It uses quantized model weights and ONNX runtime, while also maintaining a competitive accuracy. The default model is only 67 megabytes on disk, and it's way lighter than most of the models that you're gonna find on Hugging Face. Now, you can choose Fast Embed when you need your embeddings to run on premise, or if you don't want to manage GPU dependencies for your embedding models and need high CPU inference, and if you would like a tight integration with Quadrant. It's also a scalable and low cost solution for high volume embedding generation. 
The dimensionality of Fast and Bad is 384 by default, but there's multiple models that you can choose from when working with it. We're going to be using Fast and Bad for some of the future tutorials that we're going to be uh, doing. So we're going to understand how this integration with Quadrant works and how you can easily just upload your data to Quadrant using Fast and Bad without downloading and using external embedding models. But of course, we cannot leave of mentioning the high quality and versatility of Hugging Face models. Now, Hugging Face has multiple different models that you can choose from depending on your specific need. So if you need an embedding model for a specific data set that you're working with, most likely you're going to find a fine-tuned model for that within Hugging Face. But the dimensionality can vary a lot depending on what you need because of so many different domains and languages and tasks that Hugging Face embeddings are made for. They also allow you to fine tune your embedding model for a specific data set if you'd like, making it a very good choice if you're looking for open source options for embedding models. Now, even though it's not as optimized as Fast Embed to run on CPU, its models are still very fast. And even though there's not an integration tightly with quadrants, you can still easily use it. And we're actually going to show you how you can start working with Hugging Face embeddings by the end of today. To use Hugging Face Embeddings, you're going to need to be downloading the library Sentence Transformers. And they are a very good choice if you need a specific model tailored to a niche task or industry, or if you want full control over the model selection and fine tuning process, or if you have a GPU and you can handle larger models for higher accuracy. Everything is also open source and can run locally if you're looking for that kind of requirement. Now, of course, there's also cloud-based types of embedding models, such as the ones offered by OpenAI and Gina AI. Those are very high quality, I'd say, depending on the model that you choose, but you also have to pay for it. They are usually higher dimensional and have more precision. And basically, there's no local compute needed. Obviously, everything runs through the API of the provider. The dimensionality can also vary within those models, ranging from 256 to 3072. Those are all configurable, but the OpenAI Text Embedding 3 models are among the most optimized commercial embeddings out there. Of course, if you're thinking of using cloud-based embedding models, you won't have to worry about embedding generation scalability since everything will be performed by your provider. And basically you can choose OpenAI embeddings if you want to prioritize ease of use and cloud scalability, avoiding model management. Also, if you need multilingual support or state of the art accuracy, those are great models to pick from with minimal setup. Also, if you don't mind the API costs and latency in exchange for high quality embeddings, and if your workload fluctuates and you need a more elastic solution. Now, when thinking about picking the right embedding model, it really depends on all of those things. Depending on your data, you might want to pick an embedding model that's fine tuned for that specific type of domain. For example, if you're working with legal data, there are embedding models that can be fine-tuned or have already been fine-tuned that works best with that type of language and domain-specific vocabulary. Choosing the right embedding model will largely depend on the type of data that you're working with. We talked a lot about vectors, but there is still a very important part of our point that we haven't mentioned, which is the payloads. We worked a little bit with payloads in day zero, but now things get more interesting. We're going to understand what types of payloads can I upload to my point and how can I retrieve my points depending on the payloads that I have. Sometimes you need more than just numbers to fully capture the essence of your data. Payloads holds metadata, which is basically structured information of that point. It could be textual data like descriptions, tags, categories, or it can be numerical values like dates or prices. This extra information is super important if we want to filter or rank our search results based on the criteria that is not directly encoded in the vector. For example, if you're searching for a picture of a dog, the vector helps the database find images that are visually similar. 
But let's say you want results showing only images taken within the last year or those tagged with vacation. The payload can help you narrow down those results by ignoring vectors that don't match your query vector filtering criteria. These are the types of payloads that we can use alongside vectors. We have the scalar, which is basically numbers or booleans. We can use that for prices or ratings of our point. We also have categorical, which is basically tags tags. For example, category electronics, brand, Nike, and so on. We also have geolocation, which is basically latitude and longitude pairs for location-based filtering. Timestamps that store date and time, arrays with multiple values, and also nested objects. Once you've added your payloads, you can apply filters to narrow down your results. And there are also multiple types of filters that you can apply to uh, better narrow down what you're looking for. For example, you can use logical filters, which is basically and, or, or not. They are logical operators. And you can find items with that that match multiple conditions or exclude certain results. When you're using that, you use the query format must, should, and must not. You can also use match to find an exact value. For example, find products where category equals electronics. Then you use match and give the value electronics. You can also use match any to find the payloads of points that contains any of the given values, such as find items where the color is red or blue. You can also use match except to match the payload that does not contain the given values. You can also use a range to filter numerical values within a specific range. For example, find products with the price above 50 and the price below 200. We went over all three most important entities within a point, but we also need to remember that those points will be placed within an embedding space or a vector space and we will retrieve those points based on similarity. But what does that mean? Well, in day zero, we use something called distance metric to understand how similar one point is to the other and retrieve the most similar point back to me. But what those distance metrics are really measuring? Let's talk about that in the next video.